2 Samuel chapter 15, in verse 1. Isn't it good to just be here? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have great, I have great personal prayer. Totally, dif totally different. But I can't get this in personal prayer. That's why we are not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Such is the manner of some. There's something about us, family, being together. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, in the course of time, Absalom, everyone say Absalom. Absalom provided himself, that is always a bad thing, he provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. Could you turn down the floor for me? I do not like to be that loud in my own ears, which is a rare thing for a preacher. <laughs> Verse 2, he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone would come with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. And then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who had a complaint or a case would come to me and see that they have received justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach down his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And Absalom beha behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. Uh, if you've read the book, this is talking about Absalom, if you couldn't have guessed. And I just want us to just, just receive what God would say to us today. Because this this is going to be interesting to see what God does. So, Father, right now in Jesus' name, we just ask you just to get involved in this word. Lord, this is your word, and uh, these are your ideas, not mine. So, Lord, let your word go forth. Let your word move us forward in you that we might follow you more closely. And that, Lord, we would always be obedient to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. So has anybody been like me? And it doesn't happen much in the country. It happened a lot more in the city when I lived in the city. Um, but you ever have any little neighborhood kid come up and knock on your door? And he's like, hi, I'm raising money for whatever. Would you buy some candy? Anybody have that kid show up at your door? Is this a country thing that doesn't happen? Does this not happen in the country? Because usually, okay, I got, I got some people who are saying, the rest of you look all, looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, put it this way, in the city, we have these kids who go door to door because the, the houses are really close. Around here, the kid would have to eat like his entire box of candy to be able to nourish himself as he goes to, from house to house. But in like the city where there's houses next to each other, they bang out like streets, be selling hundreds of candy bars, and they'll come up to your house, and they've got like this assortment of candy bars. They've got crunch, and they've got almond, and then they've got my weakness, which is caramel, or caramel, as some of you would say. And, and I started thinking about it one day, when these little rugrats came and knocked on my door. And, and I started thinking, I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. So I get to give you my money, and then I get chubby. Is that correct? <laughs> it sounds to me like I'm getting the short end of the stick here. Like you get the money and, and I get to work out extra hard the next few days. 
And, and I want to say this. And I, want to, I want you to understand that sometimes people feel like preaching's that way. Sometimes people feel like a message is that way. Like, like that we somehow, as, as preachers, that we're, we're preaching something that's going to benefit us. So like, if I preach on tithes, that, you know, I need a new car. And, and that's, that's not it. Maybe I just want you blessed. That's actually why I would preach it. Because I want to see you blessed and living in God's blessing. And sometimes, you know, maybe we talk about obedience. And, and I've seen, just being honest, I've seen at times people preach about obedience and about submission in ways that certainly empowered them. But see, what I want you to understand today is that obedience and submission to God and to whom he sets over you is essential to find the fullness of what God has in your life. So I want to talk to you for a little bit about Absalom. Now, I'll be honest and tell you that as your pastor, um, this is not my favorite message. I'd much rather be able to talk to you about healing and see God heal you or I'd be able to talk to you about um, any other thing. I, I, I don't think I've ever preached on money here. Um, and I'm not preaching about money today. But I'm probably preaching on your second least favorite thing. I'm going to talk to you about submission. Because we're all, hear this, and I want you to hear this from me. I am a rebel by nature. By nature. It's just the way I'm built. Because this is the thing. I'm a son, originally, of, of Adam. And, and what's terrible about all of our lineage is that our father, our great-great-great-grandfather, the, the origin of our race was a rebel when there was, there was no reason to rebel. He just, he rebelled because he was trying to get better for himself than what God had already given him which we all look at and think is crazy, but, but the reality is that, that he was trying in his own power to get something that God had not given him, and yet God had given him everything. The only thing that God had withheld from him was the bad stuff. But in, that, in, in his action of rebellion, we all became rebels. And so I'm a rebel, and so are you. In fact, this whole nation is built on rebellion, and if there's, a, if there's a seat of rebellion in this nation, I hate to tell you, it's Pennsylvania. Because Philadelphia is where we wrote the Declaration of Independence and signed it. Philadelphia is where the Constitutional Convention convened. Philadelphia is where the Liberty Bell rang out when we declared our independence from England. So if there is a seat of rebellion in this nation, honey, it's here. So I'm looking at, you know, we're the best rebels in the entire union. <laughs> but see, this is the thing. We all have a rebellious streak. Um, I remember when, when Mariah was just a little girl. She was just a baby. Gabby was very compliant, and Mariah was not. <laughs> and I remember one time when Mariah was in trouble. She's like two. Denise will tell you this story better than I do. But she was like two years old, and Denise was like, you go sit on that couch. You're in timeout. And so she, she sat her down on the couch, and Mariah got up. So Denise picked her up and put her back on the couch, and she got up. This went on for like five minutes. Finally, Denise was like, I'll sit with you. And just sat down and just held her down and Mariah's like screaming and squawking and there's, there's something in us from this high that we don't want to be told what to do. We have this strong sense of independence in this area just like New England where I'm also from. So I may be worse off than all of you. But we're a nation founded on rebellion. In, in our culture, rebellion is a value. It's a value. Now, not if it's your kid. <laughs> then you repent of your mis misunderstandings. But 
We value it. And in many ways, it brings us some of our best things because there's something about Americans that we don't settle for the status quo. We don't just just settle for good enough or the way it's always been. We are independent thinkers. We reject injustice. And we're innovators because we don't accept things as they are. But there's limitations too. Because this is the thing, and I need you to hear me really, really carefully on this. The foundation, the foundation of our call from God is to follow and obey him. This series that I've been preaching for the last few weeks, and we're down to our last two. Some of you are wishing I had stopped last week. The premise of this this series is that we are called to be Davids. That God has called each of us to step into that place of reign where we step into our full ministry, our full maturity, our full calling, and establish the kingdom of God in that location, whatever that is. But I want you to hear me. The reason I decided to preach this, because honestly, I wasn't going to. I was going to preach next week's message this week and skip this one. And the Lord said, preach that. And this is why. Because the Lord spoke to me years ago and said, every David can become an Absalom. So who is Absalom? Well, what you might not know is he was probably David's greatest son. See, Absalom was was David's second oldest boy, a man of incredible gifting and talent. They they said that in the Bible it says that, that he was a man who was so handsome that there was nobody in all of Israel to match him in physical beauty, that that from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, that he was flawless, perfect, a physical specimen beyond anything you've ever seen. He cut his hair once a year, and it grew so much and so lush that when he trimmed it, it says that he had about five pounds of hair cut off once a year. And not only was he that, but he was charming. He, he had a way that he knew people and knew how to relate to them. He would, he would find, as you read in, in, in the, uh, the story here, that he would see people coming and he would talk to them and charm them with his charisma and, and just draw them close to him. He made people feel like they mattered. Here's the crowned prince of Israel, the man who's clearly the next in line for the throne. And when they bowed themselves in front of him, that he would come and he would bow down and pick them up and hug them and kiss their cheek to let them know that he wasn't above them, that they were just with him and that, that he was right there in the midst of their struggle with them. He had an incredible ability to bring people close to them and to lead them forward in a direction that he had chosen. And if he had chosen to follow the Lord. The story of David's successor may be very different. We may have never heard the name Solomon. We may be talking instead about Absalom. But see, there was a problem with Absalom. He became bitter in his heart. That bitterness caused him to rebel against his father. And to call him to to set up a coup to remove his father from the throne and to become king in his stead. I want you to hear me on this. Hurt and bitterness brings you to the place that you will rebel if you let it. Hurt and bitterness can bring you to the place that you rebel if you let it. It's one of the reasons that Jesus is so big on forgiveness. 
It's one of the reasons that forgiveness is the thing that, that liberates you and sets you free because the reality of life is that, that people are going to hurt you and, and, and when you forgive, you set yourself free from the bondage that it wants to bring into your life and, and it causes you to be able to step into the place that God really has for you in the time that he has for you. In reading and studying David for many years, I have no doubt in my mind, that Absalom was called to be the next king, that he was going to sit on the throne of David, that he was going to be the one who would reign over all of Israel and command all of Israel's armies and would lead them into greater places than David ever could have. But because he allowed bitterness into his soul, he stepped out of God's process and muddled up God's plan. He broke out of God's perfect will that for his life where he was growing him and he would have been able to look back at the tragedies of his life that caused him to get angry at David and been able to look at those things and say, look at what God has done through them. And instead he rebels against them and brings himself to ruin. There's so many times I want you to hear this. We go through hurts, and, and some of it is unjust. There is injustice in the world. There are times that you are going to suffer, and that there's no good reason for it, whether it be by the hand of a father, or by a teacher, or by a coach, or by someone else in authority over you, some pastor who's hurt you in the past and caused you to be damaged in your soul, and there's injustice that has been done to you, but I want you to hear me. You have a choice. You have a choice in how you respond. You can rebel. You can do what's natural and say, what you did is wrong, and call them out. And, and, and shame them in front of everybody. Or you can follow the Lord and forgive. And maybe they do need to be called out. And maybe they actually need to go to the police. Maybe they need to be arrested. Maybe they need to go to jail for a long time. That's not for me to decide, nor is it for you to decide. But what you need is to forgive. Because when we forgive... We set ourselves free to enter into the place that we can become a David. Because as long as we hold our bitterness, as long as we hold our unforgiveness, then what ends up happening is that seed of sour emotion inside your soul will begin to, to cause it to rot. See, bitterness is the worm that will eat your soul out from the inside out. We need to forgive no matter who it is, no matter what it is, no matter what happened. See, when you, when you are hurt, you have only two options. Hear this. Please hear this. You have only two options. You are either going to forgive or you are going to get bitter. That is it. There is no middle ground. There's no third option. It, that seed does not lay dormant in your soul. It is either growing and producing a root of bitterness, or you're going to dig it out and throw it by the wayside and let your soul flourish. But the choice is yours. But I'll tell you this. If you allow for bitterness to grow, in the end, it will kill you. It will kill you. The truth is that, that most rebellion, hear me on this, because we're all rebels. Most rebellion grows out of injustice. Most rebellion grows out of injustice. As I mentioned before, that it's not always the case. Adam sinned without injustice. But for the rest of us, most of us have been 
bruised, taken advantage of, abused even by someone that we trusted and it has produced a fruit in our lives that's killing us. A lot of times, the reason a child rebels or the reason that, that a, a woman can't be controlled, <laughs> those are very old words that some of us still hear speak. The reason that sometimes a, a, a wife doesn't listen to her husband the way that maybe she should scripturally which, by the way, if you know my wife, means with a lot of debate and discussion and sometimes disagreement and raise voices. But in the end, I still hold the trump card and we make that decision. And there's been times I've been wrong and she's told me later about it. Just for the record, I want you to understand how I believe this is supposed to work. But... If she ended up rebelling fully, the reason usually is because a husband has somehow violated her trust. And because trust has been broken, she will rebel to preserve herself rather than put herself in jeopardy under someone she doesn't have confidence in leading her properly to take care of her. Is this making any sense? You see, injustice, hear me, injustice usually produces rebellion. But we have to choose how we're going to go about it. We've got to choose to not rebel against God or against someone else in authority over us We've got to choose to forgive and allow God to work out the injustice to bring justice to it. You see, Absalom got upset because David initially brought sin into his house by sinning with Bathsheba, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. And that seed of sin in David's life brought this whole wreck into Absalom's life where his sister ends up raped. Absalom ends up killing his stepbrother. And the whole mess deteriorates from that point because he became angry with David and his lack of response and his lack of responsibility. The man who was in charge was not taking care of his family and the people under his care. And it caused for Absalom to raise up in rebellion. Was he right? Yes. But his actions weren't. His actions brought only death. You see, Absalom is on one end of the spectrum and David's over here. A lot of times when we think about David, we think that the opposite of a David is a Saul. That's not it. The opposite of a David is an Absalom. Because, because David never would touch Saul. As, as wrong as David had been done by Saul, as Saul ran around the wilderness trying to kill David, David had two opportunities to completely wipe out Saul. Saul, Saul was given to his hand. Literally, his men are going, God has given you Saul. He's right here. Kill him. He said, I will not touch God's anointed. I will not touch the man that God set to be king. Because he understood that even... If the person in the position is wrong, the seat is the thing that's got to be protected. You may or may not agree with this president, but I'll guarantee you if you agree with this president, then you didn't agree with the last one. But I want you to hear me on this. Your attitude better be the same about both. If it's not, you're wrong. 
Because it's not who's sitting in the presidency that matters or their values or anything else. What matters is that that person is the president of the United States. It's the seat that holds the authority, not the person sitting in it, regardless of their politics. We think that we have the right, because we're rebels, to judge and condemn and criticize those we don't agree with. Sometimes, honey, it's the seat that deserves your allegiance, not the person sitting in it. <laughs> Fun message, right? It's still truth. If you don't like it, it's not my problem because this isn't my word. This is his. David wouldn't touch Saul, but Absalom staged a coup against David. Saul tried to kill David many times, but David never gave in to that seed of injustice and caused bitterness to, to dwell there. But Absalom was hurt over his sister, over what happened there, and it killed him. Absalom's rebellion stole everything from him, his joy, his peace, it stole his relationship with his father. In the end, it stole his calling and his life. And it'll do the same thing to you if you do not deal with the bitterness that you will carry in your heart. Because as I said in the beginning of this message, the foundation of Christianity is following Jesus. It's obeying him, stepping out of our boat and stepping into his promises, his purposes, and his plans for our lives. When Jesus called a disciple, and you've heard me say this many times if you've been here, he'd say, follow me, and they would leave what they were doing and follow him. It was the death of the old life so that the new life could come. That is what letting go of those things does. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. How important is following God? How important is obedience to God? Listen to what the Lord says, or what Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15. Verse 22 says, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. King James would say, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. How bad is witchcraft, folks? That's what rebellion is to the Lord in his eyes. And arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. You see, if we are going to remain in our rebellion and in our arrogance, according to scripture, because when we're rebellious, it's because we think somehow we're worthy of it. We remove ourselves from the opportunity to reign. Can I tell you, long before I met you guys, I didn't think I wanted to be here in the middle of the woods with more cows than people. I mean, I, I'd always thought I was going to have a, 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 a multi-ethnic church, and, and the best I can get to around here is black and white cows. But see, I want you to listen to me. God told me to come. And, and, and I came not so much because I loved you because I didn't know you yet. I came because he told me to. And because I listened, we are in a place right now where, as Kim said, the valley 
is behind us. The reason, I want you to hear this, the reason you're hearing this word now, it may get you frustrated. You may go home angry at your pastor. That is totally cool. I get it. I've gone home angry at my pastor before too. But I want you to hear me. The reason you're hearing this word now is because we're coming out of the valley. We're about to enter into promise like we've never entered before, at least not since I've been here for sure. And you need to hear this word because if you're not going to follow, then you won't receive. If you're not going to follow him, then you're not going to get what he's got for you. God needs you to understand today that you need to follow him pinnacally. But that that also includes, hear me, that does include following the man that he puts over you. And whether you like it or not, as your pastor, that means I lead the flock. That means I'm going somewhere and you're following if you're part of this church. And, and I don't say that arrogantly. I, I hope you know me. I hope you hear it in my spirit. I'm not, I'm not yelling at you. I'm not declaring, I'm the man of God. Bless God. You're going to follow me. <laughs> I tell you in submission to him and in submission to you that I am, am following him as best as I know how. But, but if, you, if you don't feel like you can follow me, if there's something I've done that I need to be forgiven for, please let me know. Or if there's something that you, you feel like you can't follow my leadership, then you need to go somewhere where you can follow the man of God that's there. I am totally cool with that if that's really the way you feel because the reality is this. You need to be in submission to the man who's pastoring you because he is the one who's trying to lead you to the kingdom of heaven. We're trying to take you into the promises that God's got for you, not into conformity of some form of religion, or into some, some, I don't want you all to be mini-me's because Lord knows you'd be way short. <laughs> I don't want you to look like me or talk like me or act like me. I want you to be you, but I want you to find that God is leading you forward into the promises he's called you to. And the only way that can ever happen is if you're following closely to him and you can't hardly do that if you're not following closely to the man that you've put under yourself under Hebrews 13 7 says have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority hear this this is why this is why God says this is important because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. <laughs> For that would be of no benefit to you. You see, what you don't know is that when I pray for you and the things I do to try to lead you forward, I give an account for him, to him, for what I've done for you to lead you forward. And if I've not done well, I will answer to him. As someone who's been abused by pastors, as someone who, who has had these scriptures preached at me as weapons, I understand what it feels like to be abused from this place down to there. And what I can promise you is that I will do my best to never make you feel that way because I lead you with all humility and respect for you. See, but God wants to take you somewhere. And he created the fivefold ministry to be able to hear this, to equip you, to make you fully able to step into what God's got for you. Doesn't that sound good? Good. 
He has us here, this ministry team, so that, that he could build you up so you could fulfill your ministry and live your best life. That's what God wants. But you've got to be in a place where God can shape you. If you're jumping around from church to church or from thing to thing, then you will never sit long enough under a man that he might be able to impart something to you that you can grow. And if you're just waiting for good messages that make you feel good, make you leave better, feeling better than when you left, then you will never grow. There's times you got to get, I got to make you uncomfortable so that you can grow. Because otherwise, if I'm, just, if I'm just preaching you nice messages, then I'm just taking your money. God wants you to grow. God wants you to grow. See, the qualifier, though, the qualifier for submission, I need you to hear this. Are you ready? The qualifier for submission to a man of God is that he is godly and following him. That's the qualifier. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And if a man of God is truly following Christ and you've put yourself in the place where he is leading you, then trust him. Go forward with it. I do my best to live this way. Paul called them, or excuse me, John... Jesus called them together. This is Matthew chapter 20. He called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. You'll never know the days I fast for you. You'll never know the, the prayers I pray for you. You won't. And you're not supposed to. But I ask you this. I ask you to follow me as I follow Christ. My only qualifier in leading you is that I'm following him. But if I am, then let's go somewhere. See, you are going to have to choose if you're going to follow or if you're not. I'm going to challenge you so that I stretch you so that you can become all that God created you to be. And it's probably going to be a little uncomfortable for you like maybe today is. But if you will step into it, you will never have felt so alive. So here's a little exercise for you. You ready? If you're taking notes, you want to catch this. Do you have, this is a question, do you have trouble submitting, obeying to your leadership? Whether that be a pastor or a boss or your parents or your husband or your principal or your teacher, fill in the blank. Whoever is in authority over, do you have problems submitting to that? Then my question is this, have you ever been hurt by somebody in that position? If the answer is yes, dig that out. Dig that out and bring it to God and ask him to help you to forgive that person. Do you have problems? Here's the, the second real question. Do you have trouble submitting and obeying God? I'm almost done, gang. Looks like a Morgan here. <laughs> y'all, y'all looking a little stressed. <laughs> Do you have a problem submitting and obeying God? The second part of that question is, has he ever, do you ever feel like he's let you down? Do you ever feel like he's hurt you somehow? Because he wants you to go to him about these things. See, the reality is that we need to forgive. There's, there's people that you need to forgive, people who are in authority of you. Maybe they were even just an older sister, an older brother who maybe took advantage of you somehow or another. But, but that trust was violated. You need to forgive. You need to forgive that person who is in authority over you who violated your trust. 
Forgive that person so that bitterness cannot have hold of you anymore. This message is really about forgiveness and following hard after God. See, we are all rebels, gang. I make no bones about it. I'm probably the best rebel here. See, but most of that rebellion grew out of brokenness in me. Broken pieces of my heart that years ago were whole and somebody violated me, caused me to become broken and I rose up in rebellion against it. See, but God didn't want me to live there. He didn't want me to sit there with my brokenness and, and hide behind the walls that I had built so that I could just simply say, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, I've, I've dealt with that, when I knew in my heart that something was really wrong. You see, I didn't know why everybody who wanted me to follow them, I had a hard time doing it. But it was because... Bitterness had caused me to rebel against everything that looked like authority in my life. But that was Absalom's story. But that does not need to be our story. You hear me? That was Absalom's story. Absalom's story is that his bitterness robbed him of everything. It robbed him of his throne, his calling, his ministry, and in the end, his life. All the good relationships he had, it destroyed them all. But that does not have to be our story. Because we can choose to forgive. But I, hear, I, I want you to hear this. Before you can even choose to forgive, you can choose to submit. And so today, right now, across this room, I want you to just interrogate your heart for a moment. And if you have a problem with rebellion, I get it, I get it, I get it. But there's a cross we can go to and we can bring our sin, scripture says, as the sin of witchcraft. We can bring it to the cross and Jesus can say, I forgive you as we submit ourselves to him and to the leadership he puts over us. And if you don't agree with where I'm going, honey, pray for me. I need your prayers more than you could ever know. But we are going somewhere. But we need first to submit to him. Let me pray for you. Father, I don't ever want to be an Absalom story of this man who is so greatly gifted. Definitely your hand was on him and you were going to use him mightily, I think, as the next king of Israel. Becomes a bitter soul and rebels against his dad and sits on the throne for a little while, but only to be killed later. Not even by his father, but by a rebel general who is bitter for David and the injustice that his son had done to him. Father, we're all rebels here. And you died for us. You died for all of us rebels. You died for all of us, all of our sins. You died for them. So Lord, I bring my rebellion to you right now and I ask you to forgive me. And I submit to you again. I submit to my pastors. I submit to the men you've placed in my life. Lord, because I need to be kept close to you by following them. And I pray right now for everybody under the sound of my voice, whether they're in the room or on the internet, wherever they're hearing this message, that Lord God, they understand that this is not about power. It's not about being over somebody. 
but it's about the order that you create so that we can be led into your promises, Lord. I pray for just a submissive spirit in me and in everybody else here that we would follow hard after you and that nothing else would matter. I repent right now in Jesus' name. And I ask you to forgive me. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. If anybody needs prayer, the band's gonna sing. If you need to just come and just get something right with Jesus, or if you need someone to pray for you, come on up here, because we're all rebels. We all need Jesus to heal us. Come on.